A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we are going to be doing a exam review for genetics uh, 2416 for the midterm exam. So this exam uh, is relatively short for a midterm. It's only 50 questions long, and there are approximately four to seven questions per chapter, uh, and it covers chapters one through nine. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is not going to be a comprehensive review of the material because you already have full-length lectures that you could watch for that, but this will just be uh, highlighting some of the more important parts of the material, uh, the parts that you may want to really make sure that you know for the exam. Now, this is not, again, uh, a comprehensive review of the material, nor is it a very a, a totally comprehensive review of what's going to be on the exam. This is highlighting the major points that you should definitely know, but to really do well, make sure you know all the material. Uh, there are no shortcuts to doing well in the, in, in a class, so make sure you know all the handout material and you've read the chapters. Uh, you know, make sure you, you put some time in and, and learned the material. Now, um, I am going to go through and highlight some material, but before that, I do have a really good video on how to study in college, and this these are my best tips and tricks for how to do well in college. Uh, it's what I used, the techniques I used when I was in college, and um, it's how I did well, so um, I highly recommend it. I'm going to throw it in a card above if you want to watch that video, how to do well in college. I think that'll help a lot. Uh, with not just this class, but all classes that have these types of biology uh, uh, basis with, with handouts and, uh, you know, these types of science classes. I think it, this will help you the most. So getting back to our exam review, let's look at chapter one. Again, there's between four, five, six, sometimes seven questions per chapter because there's nine chapters and there are 50 total questions on the exam. It's a multiple choice exam, uh, so it should be pretty straightforward. As long as you know these concepts uh, inside and out, you should be able to do well there. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. One thing you want to know about is, let's see here, you definitely want to know what a genome is. Oh, uh, please do know uh, these things here. The Let me make this bigger. Hold on, let me make it full size for you. No transmission genetics is the study of heredity. Molecular genetics concerns the chemical nature of genes and population genetics. This is the looking at uh, basically evolution. Fundamentally, it's the study of evolution. Okay, so... Please make sure you know those things. Uh, what else? Um, remember we talked about ge genetic model organisms? Definitely know about genetic model organisms. Know which ones would be the best, which ones are not good, and why. What else do we have? Uh, the basic principles of heredity. Remember some of these founders we talked about, uh, like uh, Mendel, like Darwin, know their contributions. So what did Mendel bring us? What did Darwin bring us? What did Borlaug bring us? Uh, Etc. So if you see a name, just try to understand their contribution. Uh, what else? Do you remember all of these uh, old debunked theories? Uh, let's go to the debunked theories here pangenesis, preformationism. I know they're not valuable anymore, but they do speak to some of the early misconceptions of, of genetics. So do know, uh, for example, inheritance of acquired characteristics. What does that mean? Blending inheritance. What does that mean? And, you know, and these are defunct, right? These are disproven concepts. And then do you know these terms? Remember the terms that you needed to know? Genes, alleles, traits, 
phenotypes. So you should know those terms for sure, for sure. What else do we need to know? Um, let's see. So chromosomes, no chromosomes. And then do you, do you remember chromatin is DNA plus histones? Uh, do bacteria have histones? Do bacteria have histones? No, they have some histone-like proteins, but they don't have histones. Remember that? Do archaea have histones? That's a trick question. Do archaea have histones in their chromatin? Some do. Yes, you should know. Some uh, archaea do. Okay, so only archaea and eukaryotes have histones in their chromatin. Bacteria do not have histones in their chromatin. What else? Let's go on to chapter two notes. What do you say? Chapter two notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see here. Oh, you should know that prokaryotes have one origin of replication. Eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication. You should know what homologous pair means. You should know what sister chromatids are. Homologous chromosomes. What are those? The difference between diploid and haploid. What does that mean? Oh, uh, in fact, you should know the difference between diploid, haploid, polyploid. You know, uh, all of those terms. Yeah, so know the term diploid. You should know the concept of centromeres, telomeres. Okay, remember that, again, eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication. You should know the structure of the mitotic chromosome here. Mitotic chromosomes have telomeres at the ends, centromere at the, at the somewhere in the middle, right? Um, do you guys remember that the centromeres and the telomeres and the Y chromosome are areas of heterochromatin? Remember that? You should know that the kinetochore proteins attach to the centromere and that's the docking site for the spindle fibers during mitosis. Uh, what else should you know? You may want to know the different types of centromere positioning, submetacentric versus metacentric, telocentric, acrocentric. And then obviously know the cell cycle. So you have interphase. Uh, what are the parts of interphase? You should know what happens during G1, S, G2, G0, and then M phase. You should know that includes mitosis and cytokinesis. Mitosis is prophase, metaphase, or pro metaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. What happens during each? Um, you should know that, oh, you should definitely know for the exam, you should definitely know what is the outcome of mitosis. And that is what? two genetically identical cells, right? Definitely know about that. Um, what else? So here's an overview of uh, cell cycle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely know again what's happening during G1, during S, during G2. Mm. What is cytokinesis? Mm. Let's see. Okay, and then for mitosis, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, you should be able to answer during metaphase of those listed. During metaphase, what lines up? 
and then during anaphase, what separates from what? Does that make sense? So during mitosis, what lines up and what separates from what? During meiosis one, what lines up and what separates from what? During meiosis two, what's lining up and what's separating from what? During metaphase and anaphase respectively. What else? You should know what alleles mean. Uh, what is the term for an individual having two of the same allele? Remember that? Homozygous. Two different alleles? Heterozygous, right? So know those terms. No wild type. No dihybrid. No monohybrid. Okay. What else? What did meiosis one teach us? Uh, well, there was... Uh, Meiosis one included tetrad formation during prophase one, crossing over during prophase one. Uh, then what lined up at the center of the cell? The tetrads lined up, the homologs lined up at the center of the cell. What separated from what during meiosis one? The homologs separated. The homologs separate during meiosis one. Meiosis two. What's ha uh, oh, and by the way, sorry. Also, during meiosis one, independent assortment happens. Remember, independent assortment happens, which means the tetrads can line up any which way with the maternal homologs on one side or the other. It's a 50-50 chance. Meiosis two, what lines up at the center of the cell? The non-identical sister chromatids line up, and then the non-identical sister chromatids separate from one another. And then you should obviously know what is the outcome of meiosis. Well, you have uh, four genetically distinct cells, four genetically non-identical cells called the gamete cells. Yeah, crossing over, we touched on that, tetrads. Okay, what else? You should know how Mendel's principles of segregation of alleles can be can be explained by meiosis, right? Meiosis explains Mendel's findings, but Mendel didn't know about meiosis at the time. What else? No, I think we touched on, oh, cohesin proteins, you should know what they are. Remember, these are the proteins that hold the sister chromatids together at the centromere. Um, but it appears that it's not just at the centromere, maybe along the sister chromatid pairs, but it does hold the sisters together, right? So cohesin proteins hold the sister chromatids together. Okay. And that's that. Let's move on to chapter three. So, so far, not too bad, right? Uh, it's not too bad. Let's go to chapter three and see what kind of material we have here to learn. This was a fun chapter. Don't forget, I do have all these reviews from 1406, if anything's confusing. Gregor Mendel, you should know that he used the pea plant, Pisum sativa, uh, to study um, uh, uh, heredity. He's the father of modern genetics. You should know that he is the reason we understand how heredity works. Uh, the basic principles of heredity is because of him. Um, you should know all of these terms. Gene, allele, locus, lo genotype, heterozygote, homozygote, phenotype, or characteristic. You should know, again, what are alleles? What are homologous chromosomes? What is the difference between a locust and an allele? Okay, you should know these conclusions of monohybrid cross. The monohybrid cross taught us the principle of segregation of alleles, right? Two alleles separate with equal probability into the gametes. And then, do you remember the monohybrid cross? You should know that the monohybrid cross gave us a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio and a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. Remember all that?
What else? Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, and do you see how it's meiosis that explained Mendel's findings about the segregation of alleles? And then what else? Uh, you may want to brush up on the addition rule, the multiplication rule. When would you apply each? Um, know these uh, re uh, phenotypic ratios. So uh, if the parents are big A, little a, whoops, I can't use my laser. Uh, if the parents are big A, little a, um, what would be the genotypic or phenotypic uh, outcomes of a cross. If the parents are big A, little A, little A, little A, what are the phenotypic or genotypic, uh, you know, results of that cross? So, so if I were to tell you uh, a big A, big A crosses with a big A, big A, what are the phenotypic and genotypic ratios of that cross? So that would require you to know how to set up a uh, Punnett square and how to determine, oh, it's going to be three uh, dominant phenotype to one recessive. However, the genotype is going to be one to two to one, for instance, or two to two. Just be able to set up simple uh, squares and not just for monohybrid crosses with one trait like a, a big A, big A cross with little a, little a, but also with dihybrid. So if I said, what, are, what would be the outcome of, you know, uh, a big A, little a, big B, little B crossed with a little a, little a, little b, little b, you know, be able to set up uh, dihybrid crosses as well. Now, remember this, the dihybrid cross uh, taught us the principle of independent assortment. And when you're talking about independent assortment, you need to know that you're dealing with two pairs of alleles, two different traits. So it involves the assortment of two different gene pairs. Does that make sense? Two different gene pairs. So P color and P shape, for instance. Okay. Uh, what else? Yes, the chi-square goodness of fit test. Uh, you should know the reason you would use it, right? So why would you employ the chi-square test, um, but I'm not going to make you do a bunch of math with chi-square. I'm not going to give you a ton to plug in. You're not going to need a calculator or anything for the exam. I, I want you to know what degrees of freedom mean, why you would employ the goodness of fit test, what does the p-value mean, what is significant and what is not. Remember, a value of 0.05 p-value or less is significant, which indicates a real difference, whereas a value above 0.05 is due to chance. It's not a significant difference, right? Hmm. Pedigrees, remember how pedigrees work. What is a proband? What's the difference between a dominant pedigree and a recessive pedigree? Okay, and how would you be able to tell the difference? All right, well, that's about it for chapter three. Let's hop into chapter four. Bring, bring up chapter four for you. All right, chapter four. Remember the difference between the X and the Y chromosomes. You should know that the process of genetic variation is due to meiosis. You should know about the XXXO system. How do you become male or female? The XXXY system. How do you become male or female? Uh, you should know about the ZZZW system. How do you tell the difference between the males and the females there? And genic, or the genic system. How do you know the difference between the male or females there? There's no obvious difference in chromosomes of males and females.
Let's see, what else? You should definitely know about the SRY gene. This determines maleness. You should know uh, what Turner syndrome is. This is when you have an X chromosome and that's it, so you're a XO. You should know Klinefelter syndrome, which is XXY, multiple Xs and a Y, and poly X females as well. You should know uh, what these traits are called. Again, if you have XXY, you're Klinefelter, XO, Turner, XXX, or more, poly X, XYY is an XYY male. What else? You should know about Thomas Hunt Morgan and his studies with the fruit flies. This is a sex-linked trait. Um, what else? Bar bodies. You should understand the concept of a bar body. This is inactivation of uh, the second X chromosome or any any X chromosome that's in excess of one X chromosome. So you should know, for example, uh, for example, in Klinefelter, you should know if the, if the genotype is XXY, only one of the X's is silenced uh, or forms a bar body. Uh, in XX or XXXY, two would be silenced because only one X chromosome is left to be, uh, you know, red. What else? You should know the concepts of dominance. Uh, so complete dominance, incomplete dominance, co-dominance, definitely know that. Um, you should know the definition of these forms of dominance. You should know, so for example, if I gave you an example and I told you the outcome, you should tell me, is this incomplete dominance, complete dominance, or what? You should know definitely the, the, the definitions of penetrance and expressivity. So if I give you an example of penetrance, you should be able to tell me that's penetrance. Or if I give you an example of expressivity, you should say, oh, that's expre expressivity. Uh, so know the difference between the two. Gene interactions, you should know the gene interactions. Uh, you should know, uh, definitely know epistasis. So what is the definition of epistasis? Okay. You should know the difference. You should know for the exam the difference between sex influence characteristics versus sex limited characteristics and also know what cytoplasmic inheritance means. Mm. Okay. Here are the definitions of those, right? Maternal effect, you know, with imprinting, you should probably know that. And then the temperature sensitive alleles, that's kind of interesting. Oh, and uh, yes, do know the difference between polygenic and pleiotropy. Polygenic characteristics and pleiotropy. All right, very good. Let's move on to chapter five. All right, chapter five, let's see what we've got here. Mm -hmm. All right, know what linkage is. What does it mean to have linked genes? Definitely know what linked genes are. And how would you know you have linked genes, right? So. Uh, what kind of cross outcome would lead you to believe that you have linked genes versus independent assortment? Mm. What else? Yes, you should know this concept right here that um, when crossing over takes place, do you remember that cro there are t there's a tetrad but the crossing over is only occurring between two of the four chromatids of a homologous pair. Remember that, that's very important to understand. 
So two of the homologs are untouched. They do not participate in crossing over in the tetrad. The other two do. Um, what else? Um, you should know the uh, coupling and repulsion. You know, the, the, the coupling, uh, the cis conformation and the repulsion, the trans con uh, configuration. You should know that concept. Okay. Uh, you should know the concept of double crossovers, right? So, for example, you should know that with double crossovers, that's going to be the least frequent outcome of a of a cross, right? If when you're studying three different, uh, let me show you. When you're studying three different uh, uh, alleles, the least common cross is going to be your double crossover event, isn't it? Because uh, it's the middle, it's the middle. Uh, I can't use my laser. It's the middle allele. The middle allele is going to be your least common uh, swap because it requires a double crossover event. Remember this uh, image here? It was spineless and, eb and scarlet ebony. This was your double crossover event of the allele SS. That was the least frequent outcome of this cross with only five and three uh, progeny respectively and that's because it required a double crossover event right so double crossovers are the least frequent in these types of crosses least frequent outcome um, again no repulsion versus coupling <laughs> what else That should be it from this chapter. Basic principles there. Okay. Oh, and recall that the closer two genes are, the closer two alleles are on the chromosome, the less frequent the crossing over will happen between them. And the further the genes are on the chromosome, the more frequent the crossing over will happen. But to truly get independent assortment, the genes have to be on different chromosomes, right? Okay, let's move on to chapter six and see what we've got here. I think we've already touched on these terms, uh, referring to where the centromere is on the chromosome. You should know what a karyotype is. Uh, do know the different types of rearrangements. What is aneuploidy? What is polyploidy? So the different types of arrangements, we rearrangements we've discussed was duplications, deletions, inversions, translocations. No, know the definition of each. What is a duplication? What is a deletion? An inversion? Uh, and a translocation. You should know with inversions, what is the difference between a paracentric inversion and a pericentric inversion? So do know that. Uh, what else? Um, translocations. Know what occurs in a translocation. You can have non-reciprocal translocation, reciprocal translocation. The difference between aneuploidy and polyploidy. Okay, with types of aneuploidy, you should know that you could have nullisomy, monosomy, trisomy, tetrasomy. Um, could you have loss of two homologous chromosomes in aneuploidy? The answer is yes. You can have an extra chromosome in aneuploidy. You could missing. You could be missing a chromosome in aneuploidy. You could be missing two chromosomes, so homologous chromosomes in aneuploidy. As long as you're not gaining an extra set of chromosomes or losing an entire set 
of chromosomes because that would be polyploidy, right? Polyploidy. Uh, let's see. You should know what non-disjunction means, right? This is the failure of separation of chromosomes, uh, proper separation of chromosomes during uh, cell division, either mitosis or in meiosis. Um, what else? Okay, those are about it. Let me see. You should understand uh, uh, Down syndrome, trisomy 21. We discussed this here in this chapter. Mm. What else? Polyploidy, again, you should know the, the concept of polyploidy. And that's it. Let's move on to the next chapter. All right, chapter seven. Let's see what we have here. Um, advantages of bacteria and viruses. You might want to know that. All right. Obviously know that bacteria undergo binary fission for cell division. Uh, prokaryotes lack a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Uh, what else? Understand what plasmids are. Know what episomes are. Episomes are plasmids that are capable of freely replicating and able to integrate into the bacterial chromosome. So do know that. You should know that the, bac the bacterial chromosome is one large circularized DNA. All right, so remember, it's very important for you to remember that bacteria have one origin of replication, which forms one transcription bubble with two forks, two transcription forks, one headed in each direction. You see this? But in eukaryotes, you have multiple origins of replication uh, and you have multiple uh, multiple uh, replication bubbles and multiple uh, of these uh, replication forks right the f factor you should know that that what the f factor is conjugation transformation transduction please know these terms conjugation Transduction, transformation, definitely know these terms. Uh, conjugation requires direct contact with a sex pilus between two bacterium. Transformation, the bacterium is taking up free naked DNA from the surrounding medium and it requires competent cells. Transduction, the virus is spreading the, the DNA, right? It's DNA spread by virus. Mm -hmm. What else? All right, you should know what F plus cells are, F minus cells, sex pilus. Uh, in conjugation, you should know what an HFR cell is, an F prime cell. You should know the what an F prime cell is. Okay. Uh, you should know the the outcomes of conjugation. So, for example, what happens in mating between an F plus and an F minus cell? What is the outcome? What is the outcome between uh, an HFR cell and an F minus cell? And what is the outcome of a F prime cell and an F minus cell? Great. You should know what the term g horizontal gene transfer means. Okay, and then bacteriophage. You should know definitely know this. Uh, what are what are virulent phage and how are they different than temperate phage? What is the difference between virulent phage and temperate phage? Uh, remember, temperate phage have two life cycle choices, two choices either to enter lysogeny or the lysogenic cycle or to enter 
the lytic cycle, right? Okay. You should know what plaques are. Remember, we talked about plaques. These are areas of where ly ly lysis happened with the bacteriophage. The bacteriophage entered the lytic cycle and destroyed the bacterium. And these plaques are clearings in the agar that you can see and count, right? So you should know what plaques are for the exam. Excellent. Let's move on. Next chapter. Chapter 8. We're getting there. Two more chapters. This one and 9. Let's see what we need to know here. We should know the x-ray crystallography. We should know how this study was conducted by who? By Rosalind Franklin. We should know the structure of DNA for sure. The What is a nucleotide? What are the parts of the nucleotide? What's the difference between a ribose and a deoxyribose? Know this for the exam. Uh, remember, ribose has a hydroxyl group on the 2' prime carbon of the pentose sugar. Uh, deoxyribose has a, only a hydrogen on the 2' prime carbon, and that's the difference between DNA and RNA's sugars. You should know the difference between purines and pyrimidines. You should know complementary base pairs, right? So if I say, what does A, what does adenine pair with? It pairs with T, thymine, in DNA with two hydrogen bonds. It pairs with uracil in RNA with two hydrogen bonds. If I were to ask you about guanine, you should know it binds to cytosine with three hydrogen bonds um, in both DNA and RNA. If I, again, if I were to ask you what, what are the purines, you should say, okay, the purines have two rings. They include adenine and guanine. If I were to ask you about pyrimidines, you should know those are the one rings, and those are, include uh, CUT, remember CUT, the acronym CUT, C, U, and T, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Phosphate groups are negatively charged. Okay, we should know all this good stuff. Uh, we've got, yes, you should definitely understand the structure of DNA. This is a genetics class. You should definitely, definitely know the structure of DNA. You've got two strands of DNA, each with a five prime end with a phosphate group and a three prime end with a hydroxyl group. Okay, you've got the two strands going in anti-parallel. You have to know that the two strands are going in anti-parallel directions. So one strand is going uh, three prime to five prime in one direction. The other strands going three prime to five prime in the other direction. So when you're looking at one end of the of the of the uh, strand of the double helix, uh, on one strand it's the five prime phosphate group. On the other strand, on the complementary strand, you would find the opposite. You would find the three prime OH. Okay, you should definitely know that. And you know what else you ne you need to definitely know for the exam? What are the bonds called between the nucleotides? You should know right here it tells you a phosphodiester linkage or, or also known as a phosphodiester bond. These are the bonds between the nucleotides. Phosphodiester bonds are the bonds between the nucleotides. You have to know that for the exam. Okay, what else? Um, what does antiparallel mean? What do A's and T's, uh, how many bonds do A's and T's form? How many bonds do G's and C's form? Um, RNA, you know, it's also directional with a five prime N and a three prime N. You should know that RNA includes uracil instead of thymine. You should know that there are 10 base pairs per turn in DNA. You should know the difference between A form, B form, and Z form DNA. A form and B form are right-handed. Z form is left-handed. You should know that B form is the most typical physiological state of DNA. That's what you're usually talking about in a cell. You should know what positive supercoiling is and what negative supercoiling is. Okay, what is positive supercoiling? What is negative supercoiling? Great. Oh, and did you notice this? 
bacterial genomes do have proteins associated with them so but are these proteins histones you should know on the exam are these proteins histones no these are histone like proteins but they're not quite histones but you should know that eukaryotes have histone proteins where the the chromosomes interact with these histone proteins to form chromatin and some archaea also have histone proteins and you should know that archaea and eukarya are more closely related, right? They're more closely related than with bacteria. Does that make sense? What else? Uh, now, euchromatin, know the, know the terms euchromatin, heterochromatin, the histone proteins. You should know that the histone proteins are positively charged. That's why they bind to the negatively charged DNA. Uh, what else? So you have the nucleosomes. You should know what epigenetic changes means or epigenetics means. Centromere structure, you should know centromere structure. Um, you have a lot of heterochromatin at the centromeres. You have heterochromatin at the telomeres. And you have heterochromatin at the y chromosome. What else? Okay. What else do we have here? I just want to make sure I'm touching on some of the important concepts here from the exam. Mm. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to chapter 9. Let's move on to chapter 9. Oops. That's not the right one. Let's go to chapter 9. Okay, chapter 9. What do I want to know from chapter 9? Again, uh, let's see. Remember that eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication, so they have multiple of these replication bubbles, multiple replication bubbles, each one with two replication forks, whereas in prokaryotes, you only have one origin of replication, one replication bubble, and two forks, right? Two replication forks. You should know that for the exam. Um... You should know that DNA is copied in a five prime to three prime direction. DNA is synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction with respect to the daughter strand of DNA. And remember the enzyme that, that accomplishes this is polymerase three, DNA polymerase three in, in E. coli. Replication can only go five prime to three prime and then remember you have leading strand and lagging strand synthesis. These are the reason you have a leading strand and you have a lagging strand. You need to know this for the exam. Why do you even have Okazaki fragments? Why do you have a leading strand and a lagging strand? Well, it's because of the anti-parallel nature of DNA. The fact that the DNA is anti-parallel, that's why you end up with the Okazaki fragments. That's why you end up with the leading strand and the lagging strand. Okay. And you should know, obviously, what the leading strand means, lagging strand, Okazaki fragments. Mm. Let's see, what else? Well, you should know what's involved in unwinding the DNA. You should know what, what are involved in the unwinding of the DNA. DNA helicase, single strand binding proteins, and... DNA gyrase. These are all involved in unwinding of the DNA. Okay, what else? Mm. Well, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, you should know what a replicon is. Uh, a replicon, where is that term? I may have missed the term. Uh, 
we'll we'll run into it but you should know the term replicon what is a replicon right for the exam what else would I want to know you should know again uh, the job of DNA polymerase 3 the job of DNA polymerase 1 um, which is highlighted here again you should know the job of DNA ligase. What is DNA ligase doing? Okay, just again, I'm making sure I'm not skipping over a bunch of material. Okay, and do you remember for every one of these replication bubbles, you have replication happening in both directions does that make sense so you have replication going towards this fork and that fork so uh, in each of these replication bubbles you have bi-directional uh, copying of the DNA uh, and and it's the same in prokaryotes as well you have one origin of replication but the copying is going in both directions at the same time remember that again you should know what DNA gyrase does what DNA ligase does. Okay, what else? You should know about the primers, right? Why do you need primers and how do they work? Okay, you should know all about the primers. So let's see, primase. You should know, again, primase is the enzyme that puts down a primer. It puts down the primer in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Uh, nucleotides are added onto the primer at the 3' prime end of the primer. Um, the, they are synthesized by DNA polymerase alpha, right? This is your primase. Uh, they are needed for DNA synthesis. They provide a 3' prime group for attachment of DNA nucleotides. They are synthesized by primase. So I know all the ins and outs of, pri of uh, primase. Know all the ins and outs of primase. Again, know the jobs of DNA polymerase 3 and DNA polymerase 1. Know the job of ligase. So basically know all of these jobs here of all of these different proteins. Very good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yes, prime. Uh, know that DNA polymerase one removes the primers after after the fact. Uh, what else? Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know if we need much else. Um, that should that should about do it for the exam. The important parts of the exam, anyway. Um, hopefully, this helps. Um, again, please review all of the material. Don't just go off of this review. Uh, I may not have covered everything you need to know in this review. What I would do is, you know, look at the handouts read the chapters, get a good grasp of the material, maybe watch my video on how to study, and um, you know, really learn the material to do the best on the exam. But if, if, if you could do nothing else, at least learn the concepts I mentioned on this exam. And I, I think you can do it. There's only 50 questions, multiple choice over these chapters. Uh, if you've learned your handouts and you know these concepts that I've been uh, kind of touching on during this review I think you're in good shape so study hard hang in there you can do it and uh, I'll catch you guys next time Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D I Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D I Dr. D Dr. D Dr. D